1494. Christopher Columbus, the most famous explorer of his age, returns to the new world. This time, he comes with a new mission to build a colony and sow vast riches. Yet within four years, the city Columbus created would disappear. His ships and his men buried in long forgotten graves. Now, two teams of archaeologists are trying to find evidence that explains the colony's demise. All these people died and passed away for some reason. His story is in the water. His time caps in the water. His ship is in the water. That's what we're looking for. On land and at sea, a 500-year-old cold case is being reopened to uncover the true story of Columbus's cursed colony. Charlie Baker looks for ships. You need to make sure you can see the bombard. As director of underwater science at Indiana University, that's his job. It's also his obsession. I'm going in. Baker has surveyed thousands of shipwrecks. The oldest so far date to the age of conquest and piracy in the Caribbean. But recently, Baker began his most important quest ever. To find a ship of Christopher Columbus. First, there's never been a Columbus ship found. Let's start from that point. People ask, why do we care to find a Columbus ship? It's not just that it's Columbus, it's the, it's the space capsule of its time. What were they carrying? What did they load it with? I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. For Beaker, finding any wreck means starting with historical sources and trying to match them to debris on the sea floor. It was this process that led him to an incredible discovery in 2006. Hola, Francis. Hi, Charlie. Hey, como estas? Good, Good to night. see you, as always. Oh, okay. Hi, young. Today, his spine lies in a chemical bath at a lab in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Francis, tell us, go. Yeah, go. Okay. It's an anchor. One beaker believes may have once been tethered to a ship of Christopher Columbus. There's Columbus potential ear the way it looks. You can see the kind of rope look to it. Yeah. Palms are placed on at the angle of the arms, and certainly it's an early anchor, right place, possible right time period. Beaker discovered the anchor just where historical sources said it should be. In a bay where hurricanes had sunk six Spanish ships. The ancient piece of iron sparked a mission to find more. This is on the trail. This anchor is a piece of the puzzle. We want a shipwreck. We don't want a part of the shipwreck. We want the wreck itself. The missing ships were part of the largest fleet Columbus ever assembled. Less than two years after his famous expedition across uncharted waters, he set out on a second journey to the New World. A journey not of discovery, but of conquest and colonization. This time, he planned to stay in a place he would call La Isabella. Everything started here. When uh, 70 ships arrived in uh, 1494, and they started the settlement, the new world, the American continent that we have now, started here, in this place. We want to talk about the first city in the Americas. We want to talk about the first church in the Americas, the first mass in the Americas, the first graves in the Americas. You really have to talk about Isabella. La Isabella was Columbus's greatest aspiration, his chance at empire. Instead, it would become his greatest failure. Hurricanes would claim at least 
with six ships. Hundreds of his men and thousands of indigenous Taino Indians would perish. In just a few years, his colony would collapse. Five centuries later, what happened here is still a mystery. One that two separate teams of archaeologists are trying to solve. When we started, we were approached to this project. Uh, of course, we were fascinated. This is a unique context. These are the first Europeans to die in the New World at the beginning of this colonization. Yeah, of course, one and two. Okay. Vera Tiesler and Andrea Kuchina are a husband and wife team from the University of Yucatan. Their specialty is bioarchaeology, the scientific study of ancient human bones. He was suffering. He had a stressful youth. Together, they've been analyzing the remains that have been exhumed from the colony and planning a new expedition to the site to gather more evidence. Bones convey us information about the diet, uh, about living styles, about occupations of the people. And then from there on, you try to reconstruct how the living population was. This is really remarkable. Most of all, a male, late teens, something like it. Every clue they find adds to the story of La Isabella, picking up with science where the history books leave off. Historical sources are typically male-centered. They tell you the official story, the one promoted by politics. And the story that uh, is conveyed by bones is slightly different. Already, the bones hint at strange details. Could there have been women on the colony? Or perhaps the first Africans in the New World? Both are conspicuously absent from the records Columbus left. Bones don't lie. They tell you about diseases, they tell you about accidents, sometimes even how people died. That's the biggest mystery of all. How and why so many colonists perished in La Isabella. 500 years ago, Columbus started his ill-fated second voyage with hope and ambition. His men were ready to settle this new world and grow rich from it. Columbus's childhood friend, Michele de Coneo, recorded their common goals. The Lord Admiral wrote to the king that he was hoping to give him as much gold as the iron mines of Biscay gave him iron. When Columbus came here, he thought he was on an island off the coast of Japan and he was going to build a fine city here through which the wealth of the Orient would flow on its way to Spain. Instead, on January 2nd, 1494, the fleet of Columbus arrived off the Caribbean island Hispaniola, today's Dominican Republic. Local Taino Indians saw them from the shore. The ships were like the nothing they had ever seen. They have stories that fly through two worlds. But the only today can be matched by an alien spaceship landed right here in front of us. This is the spot where Rats and pigs and goats and horses, priests and microbes came down the gangplank into the new world for the first time. And after that, the world was changed forever. Yeah, this putt's kind of straight on up. You got a rock on your left, but if you go straight ahead, you got some open waters. Go slow, Rob. Underwater archaeologist Charlie Beaker has brought his team back to this bay, where he found the potential Columbus-era anchor in 2006. The 
first ships of the fleet were here, it sank in this bay with the first hurricane noted by the Spaniards. They hit their bottoms on the floor of the sea as the waves went out of the first hurricane. So I think they're shallow enough to be in 30, 20, 10 feet of water. But finding them will still pose a challenge. To shrink the search zone, his team deploys a device called a magnetometer, a high-tech underwater metal detector. the anchors, all this will make electronic signature. So even with a coral here, we can read through the coral like an x-ray machine through the sand and mud and silk. Anchor works systematically in a grid pattern, creating a map of potential hotspots. Electronic survey tied to satellite positioning ended up producing 31 magnetic anomalies. So you end up having kind of a vision underwater under the mud of what might be below, and if it changes, then it's probably anchors, it's cannons, it's ship parts that will change magnetic field. Certainly, we have something man made under the mud at his belt. Okay, see straight ahead that rock? We want to mark this. Do you see it? One of our anomalies is just inside of that. With more than two dozen hot spots to choose from, Baker now has to select the most promising and take to the water. While at the colony itself, Cochita and Tiswa will start to look for more bones. On land and at sea, these two teams are trying to unravel the mysteries of Columbus's ill-fated colony. Every time that I step into the site, it's like opening up a door into the past. That's amazing. Wow, look at the site. Bioarchaeologists Vera Tiesler and Andrea Cucina have arrived at Columbus's lost colony to hunt for skeletal remains. Ah, there they are. Wow. See there. They're hoping new finds at La Isabella will help them piece together details about who the colonists were and uncover the cause of the settlement's rapid collapse. What we want to do now is expand the investigation by doing test bits and locate other burials. While we do some investigation here, I want to also concentrate on this part where there are no graves. There is some uh, record that says that up to 300 people died. We don't know, were they really 300 or maybe 100? We only have 30. So, for sure, there must be more. And that's what we want to, to find. Like the investigation at sea, Choosing where to dig is the critical first step. Location is everything. And in a settlement that spanned almost two hectares, a false start could waste valuable time. La Isabella was meant to become a grand medieval city, such as those the settlers knew from home. With fortress walls, armories, a church, and even a noble house for the Admiral. To build it, Columbus brought over a thousand men. Carpenters, sailors, soldiers, and stonemasons. As well as nobles and priests. They carry with them to the New World horses and pigs, wheat, sugarcane, and guns. But Columbus quickly found he needed something more. When Columbus decided this is the place, he did not do it because he liked it. He also did it because there was an important time of settlement and he needed the native peoples to build up his town. The 
Taino Indians had thrived for thousands of years in this very location. Some estimate their population topped one million. They lived off the bounty of a rich land, on staples that were alien to the Europeans. Their local knowledge and willingness to share it was critical to Columbus. Tainos were coming back and forth day and night and constantly at the very beginning. They were uh, supporting, helping, sustaining the new settlers with, with food. Their relationship were friendly, were amicable. With such promising beginnings, the colonists gather together to renew their faith. They celebrated the first mass in the new world. La Isabella was now officially a colony. With its days of conflict and suffering still hidden over the horizon. Centuries later, little would remain of these first days of peace. With the artifacts fresh in their minds, the team heads out into the bay, sights set on the strongest of their magnetic readings. You come out and down, and that is the, uh, that, that was the hot anomaly that you guys hit, Steve? Yeah, there's one right off that, off that rock. I'm looking for somebody to find the deep depression hole that might be there. And I'm asking to take a look, just see the bottom, fill it out. Alright, we're going in. something, there's reef here, we've got an anchor from this spot already, and in that area there's anomalies, large anomalies in the mud, there's anomalies in the corals, it's got a good scientific feel, it's got a good personal feel, and now we need a little luck. Five hundred years ago, when Christopher Columbus sailed into La Isabella, this bay was deeper and the water much clearer. Solo diver move, two divers stay still, stay still. Silt from nearby rivers and centuries of hurricanes have changed it for the worse. Charlie Baker's divers are having a tough time getting oriented. <laughs> Yeah, roger that, you now are uh, 20 feet west of the buoys. Gradually, the divers plot their grid and begin the tedious process of probing the murky ocean floor. right now. You're down there with it. You're feeling it. You're seeing it. You're touching it. Uh, they're following the sand beds along. They're running the rock. You gotta go around a coral head. You gotta regroup again. A good shot on it. Didn't see much, huh? And I know it's murky. Couldn't feel any holes or anything. Well, we'll start making our own then, okay? 
It's a disappointing first dive. Any signs of the shipwrecks are hidden by the mud. The good news is the mud's also what's protecting the ship. When we get the mud out of the way, we're going to have a Columbus shipwreck. It's going to be preserved, and they're going to tell us a lot about history that we don't know. It'll be a whole new chapter once we find the wrecks. March 1494. Christopher Columbus was just a few months into building the Great Colony. Now, it was time to get what he had come for. Gold. With Taino guides, expeditions probed the mountains and inland rivers. The settlers knew from the Tainos that there was gold to be found, but how much was not clear. The precious metal was crucial to the success of the colony. It was the economy of the age and the fuel for empires. In the early days, the searches paid off. Gold is small excellent. Gold constitutes treasure, and he who has it does all he wants in the world, and can even lift souls up to paradise. The paradise will not last long. If you want to say that La Isabella had a golden age, I'd say it was January and February of 1494. And that from then on, basically, it's a slide downhill. One specific event played a big role in that slide. The date it happened is well known. June 1495. A vicious storm hits the car. The Taino had a word for it. They called it a hurricane. It was a storm with a huge tempest of wind. Then there was a calm. The eye of the hurricane. And the tempest occurred again. The Taino knew to flee to higher ground. But the colonists hunkered down. Cowering before a terror they had never encountered. to be a bad storm. It sank ships. These ships came all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. They weren't meant to sink. But they were sunk in a hurricane. At least six ships went to the bottom of the bay, including Columbus's flagship, the Maria Galante. They have remained buried there ever since. I get to see these ships on cable being thrown up and down and bouncing and busting open. Other than his original anchor, Beaker has yet to find hard evidence of the wrecks. But his next expedition will take him farther afield. And this time, he'll find what he's after. Charlie Beaker's search for a ship of Columbus does not just take place in the water. Today, that search is taking the team down a windier path. A few hours of trekking through jungle forest brings them to a set of recently discovered caves. Researchers believe Tainos inhabited these caves during the time of Columbus, possibly even using them to shelter from hurricanes. Man, that was an ordeal. <laughs> that was something. Their guide to this extraordinary site is Dominican anthropologist Juan Rodriguez. Caves were the last place where they could retreat and hide. They took with them the most important things that they could take, the myth, the religion, their beliefs. Great caves. Far back in the cave, a wall with great historical significance. I do think we've entered another realm here. Uh, we're, we're picking up these depictions of 
the Spaniards and their arrival. Interesting that anthropomorphic or human face there, that may be some uh, European uh, deer than man. Juan, well, check this out. If you're high on the I mean, then look at that. It's like a ship coming to you. And in the whole chain of the Ace of Columbus. So the two lines could be the holes for the hose line for the anchor. Let me get a point there, John. Seems like carbon. Oh man, it's fantastic. See if you can look at that spot there. That ship could be for ships in the new world, depicting the wall. If that truly is a ship, then we're talking the first contact between the prehistoric and the historic that happened right here in the Dominican Republic and was represented by that ship. The story on the walls ends shortly after the ship arrives. And if the Tyne would have made it, this would be the next chapter for their story. And instead, this is the end of their world right here. But exactly how the end came is the question archaeologists are still trying to piece together. Andrea Cucina and his team continue to explore the territory behind the church. Wow, looking good. In a second pit, a second discovery. Nice broken. It's broken? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, we got another grave. It was completely hidden. It might have be, you know, an empty space, and instead we we have a we have a structure, and now we have a grave. So what we have to do now is slowly, carefully move all the sand and try to expose the body. If these bones can be salvaged, they will join the growing body of forensic evidence from La Isabella and perhaps reveal more insights into some of the mysteries the colony left behind. Among the skeletal information that we recollected, there were some really interesting features, uh, attributes that talk about uh, people that are probably not of European uh, ascent. It is feasible that among those first crew members of Columbus that died at La Isabella were Africans. Columbus makes no mention in his records of non-Europeans or Africans aboard his ships. But if the bones show otherwise, it would mean that at least a few of these men could have been the very first Africans in the New World. Were they slaves or sailors? And where had they come from? The answers may lie in the teeth, which have been sent to the University of Wisconsin for analysis. Teeth carry chemical remnants of what we ate as children, and those remnants can be traced back to specific locations. There were features, there were some traits that are typical of individuals of African origins. We still don't know exactly which part of the continent, but uh, it was definitely a surprise to see something that is not written in historical sources. The other big surprise from the bones is the appearance of women in the colony. This feature is female. The measurement says it's a female. Amazing. Is it not lost? It still says it's 97% female. Wow. Upon those skeletons that we think, or we're pretty sure that they're women, there's one clear European woman. So there's a clear contradiction with the historical sources that almost in all listings only name men. There were women on the ships and most probably also in the settlement at La Isabella. If true, the presence of women tells its own story. Of a settlement designed not just for quick wealth, but for a stable, permanent growth. A lasting symbol of Columbus's success. Yet it only took a few short years before that utopian vision was shattered. They were failing to adapt, but more importantly, they were falling short of the one thing that would have ensured success. 
gold. 4A after 4A into the wilderness turned up little or nothing. Several times we faced in those rivers, but never was found by anyone a single grain of gold. For this reason, we were very displeased with the local Indians. In lieu of that precious metal, Columbus turned the Taino into human commodities, and the chief source of income for the colony. There are documented uh, events where they uh, captured and enslaved 1,600 Tainos. Some of them, many of them, were sent back to Spain as slaves. Others were left here as slaves of the local uh, Spaniards. For those who remained free, there was another form of hardship. Attacks. The very first in the New World was imposed on every male over the age of 14. Each was required to produce a fixed amount of gold or face severe punishment. The relationship between these two peoples was turning from allies to enemies. Columbus was on his way to becoming a despot in the name of empire, and La Isabella was turning from dream to nightmare. Charlie Beaker is off on another expedition away from the bay. This time, their destination is the southern Dominican coast. Did you on your clothes? from the year 1502, just a few years later than the Columbus's voyage to La Isabella. It may have thrown cannons and anchors overboard as it hit ground, and those are the clues Beaker is searching for. tells Beaker all he needs to know. Though these anchors are not from Columbus's ships, they are from the same period. Later anchor design would drastically change, thanks to new metal technologies. But these anchors, and the one housed at the lab, share the signs of older equipment. The angles of the arms, the types of rings, and the materials used are a solid match. Both old enough to be from the time Columbus sailed. That anchor is the only diagnostic artifact we've excavated, anyone has ever excavated from Isabella. Uh, so until we can take it off the list, it's very, very much on the list of probability of being Columbus. On land, the careful dig is revealing more details about the newly discovered skeleton and the circumstances of its burial. From all the features that we have on the skull, are totally male. The, the skeleton was simply, you know, uh, laid down, you know, no mud pits dug in the in the naked earth. Carefully, was not thrown into, but mm, nothing sophisticated. Simple and, and fast. The way of interment tells you the story of the emergency, the urgencies that were lived here. After two hurricanes and repeated failed attempts to find gold, the colony at La Isabella had hit a tipping point. There was a lack of understanding of respect, uh, most of probably most on the part of the Spaniards towards the Taino, so obviously the results didn't have to wait long to show in a confrontational relation. The Taino reacted. Yeah. yeah. Taino reacted, Spaniards reacted themselves. Battles broke out between the colonists and the Indians. Guns against arrows. Old world against men. But was it war that killed 
so many settlers in Taino at La Isabella. Only the bones will provide proof. At the lab in Santo Domingo, Cochina and Tiesler probed the bones from La Isabella's many excavations. Finding the cause of death is a painstaking process of elimination. It's an herniation. A very deep herniation, actually. A sailor, uh, a worker, he maybe was used to carry heavy stuff. The colonists were young. Few found here were older than 45, most below 30. Their capability for hard work shows in their bones. In short, the sort of young, healthy people one would enlist to jumpstart a colony. Overall, they were not chronically sick or weak people. Yet one-fifth of these New World pioneers would die within four years. It's the sort of statistic one would expect from violent battles, from wars. The bones really don't um, reflect that, which surprises us. We did not find as many paratraumatic events or violence as we would have expected, given uh, the, all the, the historical sources that convey information about uh, the confrontations with the Taino Indians. We were surprised not to find not even one piece of evidence. None of them uh, shows any signs of violent trauma. The culprit must have been a more subtle killer. The archaeologists are forced to look deeper, while Charlie Beaker makes a final attempt to uncover Columbus's lost fleet. You see, uh, remember the old Cucurojo? Charlie Beaker and his research team are more sure than ever they've chosen the right spot to look for Columbus's lost ships. But so far, they've been unable to dig their way through the murky bottom of La Isabella Bay. We're digging, we're looking, we've gone through five feet of mud, and we're probing five feet down, and we're still not to the Columbus shipwreck. Their final effort, to try and dredge the site, at the exact spot where the original anchor was found. Next step is to write a report, clean up our equipment, fix what's broken, bring in more equipment, pick a date and do it again. We're not done. I'm driven. I want to find it. My colleagues here want to find it. We all feel it. It's just oozing. The history is here, and that's what drives us all. 
For now, Columbus's lost fleet remains trapped in mud. But in the lab, the history of the final tragic days at La Isabella is starting to grow clearer. The failure of La Isabella, there's not just one reason, but I think that most of it is that they were not really prepared to adapt. By 1496, the colonists knew they were in trouble. Their alien crops had failed, gold was scarce, and their supplies were dwindling. Food was being rationed. One cup of wheat, a side of rancid bacon, and a handful of beans was the daily portion for each villager. All of the people that have been in this island are incredibly discontented. They had nothing to eat other than the rations. They were all anguished and afflicted and desperate. The condition of the settlers in those last days makes only a surface appearance in the bones. Many of them, more than 50%, probably had scurvy, vitamin C deficiency. As this is a scurvy. Here you can see um, parotid surfaces, and here this is an ongoing process already healed, so this individual had suffered from this lack of uh, vitamin C. They didn't eat citrical fruits or anything that contained vitamin C. And you kind of question, couldn't they have just eaten the stuff that the Taino ate? This is, tells you that uh, they were utterly unadapted and they didn't know really how to uh, use the resources that they were finding here. They did not expect to have such a death toll. So the first ones to start to die, they would bird in, behind the church and they kept on doing it and kept on doing it. I think, I can imagine by looking at the distribution of the crosses, that um, it was an emergency. An emergency so rapid, it is hardly detectable 500 years later. The colony's killer acted fast and left few traces. The fact that we don't appreciate, we can detect any specific kind of diseases indicates that what killed these people were very acute diseases, very common and yeah. endemic in, in the New World. And it doesn't leave uh, it traces doesn't on leave. the bones. It is the lack of evidence in the bones that ultimately provides the most compelling clues. To show in bones, most diseases have to have been present for a long time. Instead, the kinds of epidemics the settlers may have encountered were acute and totally new to them. In their weakened state, even a simple New World flu could have killed hundreds. For the Taino, new diseases would take an even greater toll. The Europeans brought smallpox, measles, and typhoid with them. Diseases that would decimate the people Columbus once called no finer in the world. By 1498, the colony was abandoned by all but the dead. It was a failure for the Spaniards, but they quickly learned after that, and then they set up their colonies with a much more successful scheme. But for the Indians, for the Taino, and for the New World Indians um, in general, it was the beginning of an end, so to speak. I think this is probably the saddest story of them all. Columbus returned to Spain with his reputation deeply marred by his disastrous leadership at La Isabella. Yet he still left his mark. The European conquest of the Americas, which began here, would reshape the continent. The Spanish would conquer all. The Taino, within a generation, would be wiped out. Killed, enslaved, or dead from disease. For one side, La Isabella would be a forgotten chapter on the path of empire. For the other, it would mark the end of the world. Further skeletal remains 
that perhaps technologies not yet invented may bring researchers closer to understanding this moment. One day they hope to be able to tell not just why so many perished on both sides, but even who they were. When we started working at La Isabella, we really wanted to know who, were, who these people were. I know it's uh, almost practically impossible to say the skeleton remains of this person are what's left of Mr. So-and-so, you know, that's, that's, that would be kind of a detective story. We know it, but uh, a tiny dream would be even to be able to identify one of this individual. That's the focus of the next effort. Looking at DNA and chemical traces in the teeth to give a name, maybe a face, to a 500-year-old set of bones. And perhaps, at the bottom of La Isabella's Bay, to find the ships that have become symbols of the colony's collapse. We're on the right place. We'll be back. We'll be back bigger and stronger, more equipment. It's still there. It's still to be found. We will discover the shipwreck. If I'm around long enough, we will discover the shipwreck. Yeah, this is my Moby Dick. This is my whale. This is my albatross. This is my problem. I see shipwrecks. I see ships floating in anchor. I see a lot of people trying to set a foothold in the new world right here. This is where it started. This is where the toe first hit. The first European experiment in America descended from Grand Mission to appalling disaster in the hands of Columbus and his pioneers. It is only now, five centuries later, that we are beginning to understand why. Discover the dark secrets of history's toughest prisons, brand new tomorrow at 9.